So about five years ago, I think it was, I went with my family to the Marshfield Fair and they had a ride just like this one. The Flying Bobs kind of spins around in a circle really fast. First it goes forward, then it goes backward. I had been on rides like this countless times since my childhood and was not expecting anything unusual other than, you know, like an enjoyable little experience. But I found out soon enough that uh, my body or my, I don't know, something changes when you get older. About four minutes into the ride, four or five minutes in, I started feeling really, really sick. We're going re really fast around and around forward. And I started feeling like I was going to throw up. And it was obvious to the kid running the ride that I was in rough shape and he kind of gave me a look and he said, you want me to stop? And I said, yes, please. And he literally had to stop the ride and let me off while the rest of the people stayed on the ride. Um, it was nothing that had ever happened before. I had never been a person to get motion sick. So it was kind of a surprise to me. So I got off the ride, went and sat down and collected myself, started to feel better. The nausea went away, kind of went around the park again, did a loop around the, the fairgrounds. And about probably an hour later, we approached the Flying Bob's area again. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. I saw the Flying Bob's and I started to feel nauseous again. Um, it was the weirdest thing. But at the same time, I was thinking, oh, wow, I can use this little anecdote in my psychology class. And that is exactly what I have been doing since this happened. Uh, because what just what happened that day was an example of classical conditioning, uh, which is a form of learning that we're going to uh, be learning about in this unit. Learning makes it sound like it's much more boring than it is. Learning is actually one of the, in my opinion, one of the coolest areas in psychology because it's all about where do our behaviors come from? How do we learn them? And when you think about it, anything that you do now that you didn't do when you were first born, you must have learned it. It just makes a logical sense. Um, we don't come out into the world with much knowledge or any knowledge for that matter. So we have to learn stuff. We learn habits. We learn behaviors. We learn um, how to do things. We, we learn our, our entire lives. And school learning is only one small part of the learning that you will do forever. These are the, some of the biggest names in the history of psychology. In the top left, we have Ivan Pavlov, Edward Thorndike, and B.F. Skinner across the top row. And then the bottom is Albert Bandura and John B. Watson. These guys were practically synonymous with psychology in a large portion of the 20th century because they're all focused on where our behavior comes from. So learning, if we are going to define it, it's a relatively permanent change. It's not something that just pops up for a minute. Uh, for it to be considered learning, it means the organism, because it happens for animals too, any kind of living animal, um, it's got to be semi-permanent and it's the result of experience. And it is shown in your behavior. So that's essentially what we mean by learning. A change in the behavior based on experience that is shown in the behavior, not just, you know, in your mind. And the, the mechanism for how we learn appears to be very similar for humans and non-humans. And a great deal of the research in learning has been on non-humans or other animals. Now, the first type of learning theory in psychology was called classical conditioning. And it's called classical, not because it has anything to do with Beethoven. 
It's called classical because it is basically like the first. It's in that sense of the word. It's like the earliest form of it. Um, so what does classical conditioning involve? Well, first thing it involves is a, a reflex. We all have reflexes, um, fewer than maybe some other animals, but we all have automatic behavior, things that happen that do not require prior learning. If someone throws a firecracker near you, chances are if it doesn't hit you, you'll jump. That's an, a reflex. Okay. Um, conditioning. Think of conditioning as a special type of learning. It's an, it, it, more than simply learning, it is a systematic type of learning where you follow steps. You're not doing it intentionally. You're not doing it on purpose. When I uh, had that experience with the ride at the Marshfield Fair, th I was not doing it intentionally, but classical conditioning worked on me through this systematic procedure. And what happens in general is that you make associations, you, you learn associations and responses to different stimuli are actually learned. So conditioning versus reflexes, what's the difference? Well, conditioning requires learning. Reflexes don't. Conditioning is when you have a learned association or a learned link between a neutral stimulus and a stimulus that evo evokes a reflex. And we'll see many examples of how this works. Uh, my learned association, at least that day at the Marshfield Fair, the neutral stimulus was, you know, the, the ride itself. It had never caused anything to happen to me before. And the stimulus that evokes the reflex was the spinning around of the ride. And after I got sick, just being on the ride, just the sight of the ride was enough to make me feel sick again. This was discovered by uh, a Russian physiologist named Ivan Pavlov. He had a pretty awesome beard. And he kind of stumbled upon classical conditioning. He was not even a psychologist. He was studying digestion in dogs, and he wanted to see the role that salivation played in dog digestion. He discovered classical conditioning, which at the time was also known as, and still is, known as Pavlovian conditioning. And in Pavlovian conditioning, the basics are that you have a neutral stimulus that by pairing it with another stimulus that naturally produces some response, the neutral stimulus comes to elicit a similar or identical response. And he did it studying dogs in his lab. There's a, a photo just like this in your textbook, but I bet you did not know that this is what the people were thinking in that, uh, in that little moment. So basically what he did was he had a dog that was, um, they were going to collect his saliva in a tube while he ate. And they wanted to see, you know, how much saliva will, is necessary or they, how, how much is involved in digestion. So they collected the saliva while he ate. And this is what happened. So they would put the food in that little bowl. And it was, doesn't sound very appetizing. It was like a, a meat powder. And if you have a dog, you know that showing your dog his dog bowl or whatever he eats out of can, re, can produce a response, a very favorable response uh, for the dog anyway. Um, so the food would go into the bowl, the powder. What Pavlov noticed was the dog started salivating first just at the sight of the food, but then he started to salivate just at the sight of the man in the white lab coat who was coming to bring the food, which is if you think about it, a strange thing. Dogs don't necessarily or don't naturally drool at the sight of a man in a white lab coat. 
but that's exactly what was happening. So then Pavlov got the idea, well, what if we can swap out that guy with a white lab coat? Will the dog drool at anything? And the famous experiment that Pavlov did was that he trained the dog to salivate simply at the ringing of a bell, which is absolutely not a normal behavior for dogs. But because the, the bell was linked or associated with the food, it created this learned response where he would drool just at the sight of the food or at the ringing of the bell, I should say. Uh, this is a, another photo of the Pavlov lab with the dog up on the table. Um, I have seen this in, in my own home. Um, if you have a dog, you might recognize this. If not, you may not recognize this. This is a Kong. It is, um, they come in all different sizes. My dog eats, since he was a puppy, will finish his dinner uh, in four seconds. So we can't give him his dinner in a bowl because he eats it so fast he sometimes throws up. So we put it in, he put his meal in the Kong and this Kong is weighted on the bottom and he has to kind of roll it around and the bits come out one at a time through the hole. And instead of finishing his dinner in four minutes, he, uh, four seconds, it takes him five seconds. Um, and if I stand there holding it for him and because we make him wait, he will start to drool. And it's exactly what Pavlov showed. He has learned that this Kong means food. <clears throat> so let's get some terms out of the way. In classical conditioning, we have an unconditioned stimulus, and that's something that automatically produces a response, which is unlearned. For example, food. A dog will naturally drool with food. Um, an unconditioned response, or UCR, is uh, the unconditioned response is the automatic response to the UCS, which for the case of the dog is salivation. Okay, there's two terms and then we have two more. The conditioned stimulus, this is the, the neutral stimulus that when you link it up or associate it with the UCS, now becomes capable of getting and eliciting or drawing out the same response. And in this case, it would be the bell. And then the conditioned response, the conditioned response would be the, the response to the CS, the conditioned stimulus. And in this case, with the Pavlov dog experiment, it is salivating. So it goes like this. You present the neutral stimulus immediately before the unconditioned stimulus. Um, if they overlap, even better. So you're going to ring the bell, give the dog his meat, and then the dog salivates. And you do that again and again and again. Repeat it many times. Bell, food, salivation, and then you take the UCS away. You take the food away, and what you're going to see, ta-da, now the original stimulus isn't neutral anymore. Now the bell actually gets the dog to salivate. It, you have basically trained the dog to learn how to salivate at the ringing of a bell. Now, Typically, it does not it does not happen immediately. Um, there are only certain circumstances where it will happen right away. Um, usually, it's going to require multiple pairings. The dogs didn't immediately start to salivate when they heard the bell, and this pairing over and over is called the acquisition process. All right, so we've seen how it could work in a dog drooling over his dinner. Um, let's take a look at classical conditioning in humans. Because there are many, many, many responses that can be conditioned in humans. Uh, and these can occur without our awareness. And it can be either pleasant or unpleasant reactions. One of the most famous ex um, examples 
in the history of psychology was the Little Albert study, which I believe I talked about in the first unit. Um, John Watson and Rosalie Rayner in 1920 did a study where they took a white rat and made a f loud, frightening noise behind a little baby, which caused the baby to cry. They were basically looking to see how fear was learned or to see if phobias were learned. And they found that after many pairings of the white rat with the loud noise, the white rat who originally didn't cause any kind of fear or crying in the baby, now the white rat alone, just the sight of the rat caused the baby to cry, caused little Albert to cry. And what this study showed was that um, classical conditioning is probably where a lot of fear and anxiety in children comes from. Another example of how classical conditioning happens in humans is with dopamine. You eat a delicious chocolate chip cookie or, and you get the, um, the pleasure from eating that. You smoke a cigarette and get the pleasure out of that nicotine. You drink alcohol and you get the pleasure from that alcohol. Well, each time you do something in the, along those lines, you are causing your brain to release dopamine. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that will drive you to seek pleasure, to seek reward. So eat enough cookies, smoke enough cigarettes, drink enough alcohol, and ju eventually just the sight of the cookie or just the sight of the cigarette or just talking about it or just the thinking about or seeing a TV commercial for alcohol will make people want to go have that and uh, trigger the dopamine response, which again drives people to, to drink. Another thing that can happen in classical conditioning is known as higher order conditioning. And think of it as, um, you know, when the bell started to cause the dog to drool on its own, well, then you can take the bell and use the bell to get the dog to drool to something else. Maybe like you snap your fingers and then ring the bell and then the dog drools and then you keep doing that. And then maybe he's, he starts salivating just cause you snap your finger. So this is when the neutral stimulus, the bell in the, in the dog example takes on the conditioned property properties because you've paired it with a, a conditioned stimulus. So, uh, sorry, the, the, the neutral stimulus would be the snapping of the fingers. And now that takes on those conditioned properties, making the dog drool. And these are very remote associations. You can get far away from the original thing. Remember, meat was the thing that caused salivation. And then you went to a bell. And then you went to um, snapping your fingers. It's only, it's only as limited by your imagination what you could try to, to, um, to condition the dog to do. Uh, some of the things that will regulate whether higher order conditioning can happen would be how similar are the new and the old conditioned stimuli. You know, if you had a bell and then like, you know, a musical triangle, those are very similar. You'd be have a better chance with that. Um, how frequent uh, are, your are your pairings? Do you do it a lot? Do you train the dog a lot? Are you consistent with it? Um, all of this is going to matter. Now, there are a bunch of factors that are going to play a role in classical conditioning and how quickly it takes place, how quickly it happens, and how strong the learning is, in, is after the conditioning. So one thing we need to look at is um, the strength, the timing, and the frequency. In other, so in other words, the strength of the U, UCS is the UCS, the uncontrolled uh, stimulus, is that something that's really going to get a reaction from the dog? A piece of meat definitely would be a strong, um, a strong UCS. Maybe, um, you know, a pretzel, maybe not so much. Timing of the, uh, of the 
unconditioned uh, response. Um, I, I, I should actually say the, the timing of the um, condition stimulus, which has got to be right after, if not overlapping. And then the frequency of pairings. How often do you um, do you do you do it? How how many times has it been uh, presented to the dog or the human? Um, and it's got to be predictable. You the person or the animal needs to know after the um, after the neutral stimulus. Here comes the uh, condition stim the the unconditioned stimulus. A couple of other things happen in classical conditioning. Uh, extinction. So let's say after a while you stop giving the dog any food ever after he hears a bell. Well, the dog is not a robot. Eventually the CS isn't going to elicit any UR anymore. The, the conditioned stimulus will no longer get the dog to drool. And that's called extinction. The behavior will just sort of fade away. Uh, spontaneous recovery, Pavlov observed this, um, when after the behavior went extinct, after the dog stopped salivating, that extinguished response, the salivation at the sound of a bell, comes back. But it's usually weaker. Uh, maybe, in other words, the dogs didn't drool as much and it didn't last as long. It was not like, a, it wasn't as strong as it was originally couple of other concepts in classical conditioning are stimulus generalization. This is uh, when you have a stimulus that is similar to the conditioned stimulus that also causes a conditioned response. So think, you know, like let's take that bell. The do you ring the bell and the dog drools. Well, something similar to that bell, maybe a different pitch bell different frequency to use the uh, correct lingo um, that would be considered stimulus generalization an, an, an example that you um, could e even more easily relate to would be with phobias remember little Albert how the rat the white rat got the got him to be afraid because it was paired with the loud noise well then the, the rat could be was paired with a rabbit um, a white rabbit then um, a white fur coat could also get the um, get the boy to be afraid because because it's similar enough to, in to the fur of the rabbit or the the, the rat um, and I think if you go back earlier in the um, in the slides even a Santa Claus mask with a white beard caused Albert to cry so things that are similar to the um, to the CS can cause the CR. And then sometimes you see stimulus discrimination. And this is when you'd respond only to specific condition stimulus. Okay, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever had a, a burger or, you know, it doesn't have to be a burger, it could be anything. Um, and after you eat this, maybe a couple hours later, Oh my God, you have to go to the bathroom and you got to throw up. You know what I'm talking about, food poisoning. Well, this is classical conditioning. And because you know what happens after you get sick on something, you, can, you, you can't eat it anymore. Or you just the thought of that food now makes you sick. And this is called the Garcia effect, named after John Garcia. Um, the Garcia effect is also known as conditioned taste aversion. And a couple of surprising things that uh, happen here. First is that um, the Garcia effect or conditioned taste aversion could occur even if you got sick hours after eating or drinking. You could still make the connection between the two. Just, they didn't have to be as close, you know, ringing the bell and showing the dog the food were like run right after the other. Eating, eating contaminated food and then getting sick from it, those two things can be far apart in time and still cause um, 
and still cause uh, classical conditioning. And not all stimuli could be conditioned. It seems like certain things, um, like you, it, you, you're not going to be able to condition someone to like get sick just from the, the sight of water, because water is such an essential uh, thing for life. Here's another one. One final example. Um, you can even condition the immune system. Uh, so some studies have been done that showed asthma attacks could be con conditioned to occur. So you, you present a conditioned stimulus, the house, and what's in the house? An unconditioned stimulus, a cat, and that can cause an asthma attack. And then see if you can guess what's going to happen. You kind of link that house and the cat enough times. You go to someone's house who has a cat that makes you have an asthma attack. Eventually, just the thought of that house or just walking into that house alone can cause you to have an asthma attack. So that is the basics of classical conditioning. We will do some work with these with this in class. And um, I think by doing some examples, you'll find that it's really not nearly as complicated as it seems to be, if it does seem complicated. It's a lot of vocabulary, but once you start to see how words, terms like this, conditioned stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, UCR, all that stuff. Once you start using them, <coughs> excuse me, as as if you would do a math problem with variables and kind of plug in different things to kind of try it out, um, you'll find that it's really not that hard. Okay, and that's that's it for today's uh, classical conditioning notes.